Subcommittee on Border Security, Facilitation, and Operations will come to order. Subcommittee is meeting today to receive testimony on assessing the adequacy of DHS efforts to prevent child deaths in custody. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the subcommittee in recess at any point. The chair asks unanimous consent that Representative Underwood be permitted to sit and question the witnesses. The chair asks unanimous consent that Representative Garcia be permitted to sit and question the witnesses. Without objection, so ordered. Jacqueline Call McKean, seven years old. Felipe Gomez Alonzo, eight years old. Darlene Cristobal Cordova Ballet, 10 years old. Juan de Leon Gutierrez, 16 years old. Wilmer Josue Ramirez Vasquez, two years old. Carlos Hernandez Vasquez, 16 years old. These six children died in the custody of the United States government just in the past 18 months. These children were migrants from Central America who died of preventable conditions that went untreated. And three of these children spent the last hours of their lives in detention facilities on our southern border. We must never forget their names, their suffering, or the terrible losses their families had to endure. So we are here this morning to examine the conditions that led to these avoidable tragedies. We've seen a dramatic increase in the numbers of families and children, or children arriving on the southern border over the past several years. Most of these families and children arrive from Central America, fleeing vicious cartels, gang violence, and extreme poverty. And after surviving long, dangerous journeys, these families should have been met with safe refuge. But instead, they encountered this administration's myriad of inhumane border policies, like family separation, zero tolerance detention, and the remain in Mexico policy. These policies and management decisions by the administration have contributed to mass overcrowding and widespread inhumane conditions at customs and border protection facilities across our southern border. Numerous reports by the DHS Office of Inspector General and court observer attorneys confirm these intolerable conditions. I've seen the problems with these facilities with my own eyes, along with several of my congressional colleagues on this panel today on both sides of the aisle. Yet when pressed about these conditions, DHS has consistently failed to maintain transparency by stymieing congressional inquiries. This raises concerns that they are hiding serious issues with management in addition to the leadership vacancies at the top of the department. One example of this is the department's decision to conceal information on the death of Carlos Hernandez Vasquez. Carlos was a teenage boy from Guatemala who died tragically in U.S. custody on the morning of May 20th, 2019. CBP issued a press release later that day calling the death a tragedy and declaring that they considered the health, safety, and humane treatment of migrants to be of the highest priority. However, despite information requests by this committee, it was not until a ProPublica report was released seven months later that Congress and the public learned more about what happened to Carlos, that his death may have been caused by the failure to provide urgently needed medical care and the failure to follow the most basic procedures to simply check on a sick child. While I understand that this specific case is still under investigation, this lack of transparency by the department is completely unacceptable. The Office of the Inspector General must be doing everything in its power to examine the factors that led to these tragedies. And that's why I'm extremely disappointed that the current DHS Inspector General declined our invitation to testify this morning, especially given the recent news that his office closed its investigations into the first two child deaths in Border Patrol custody. The publicly available summaries of these investigations are extraordinarily narrow in scope. They focus only on whether DHS personnel committed malfeasance and not whether the department's policies and resources could properly protect the children in its care. For instance, even with these two completed reports, we still do not know why Felipe Gomez Alonso and his father were in CBP custody for six days before Felipe passed away. I, along with several other members of this committee, remain concerned that DHS still isn't doing enough to protect the children in its custody. Reporting over this past weekend indicates that CBP continues to detain families with young children in need of medical attention well beyond the 72 hours allowed by the agency's own protocols. 
This is a disturbing pattern that needs to be remedied immediately, or we risk losing more children to preventable deaths in the future. We must act urgently to ensure that the policies and decisions that contributed to these tragic deaths are addressed. I hope the witnesses here today are prepared to explain whether the department's current approach incorporates the lessons learned after these tragedies and how they intend to safeguard children in DHS custody going forward. As members of Congress, we may disagree about immigration policy, but there should be no disagreement that the federal government must take responsibility for the human beings in its custody, particularly young children. We must never forget Jacqueline, Felipe, Darlene, Juan, Wilmer, and Carlos. And we must never let this happen to another child again. I want to thank the witnesses for joining us, and I now recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank our professionals for appearing before us thank today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Panelists. Other members of the subcommittee are reminded that under the committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. I welcome the panel of witnesses. Our first witness, Mr. Brian S. Hastings, is Chief Law Enforcement Operations, U.S. Border Patrol, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, Department of Homeland Security. Brian S. Hastings is the Chief of the Law Enforcement Operations Directorate at U.S. Border Patrol Headquarters in Washington, D.C. He is responsible for oversight of the day-to-day -day law enforcement operations at Border Patrol sectors throughout the United States and is a principal advisor to the Chief of the Border Patrol on Enforcement Operations. Chief Hastings began his service with the Border Patrol in 1995 and has been stationed in various sectors across all U.S. borders and was promoted to the Senior Executive Service in 2018. Our second witness, Dr. Alexandra L. Alexander L. Eastman, is the Senior Medical Officer for Operations within the United States Department of Homeland Security's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office. In this role, he is responsible for operational medicine across DHS, in addition to countering threats to the U.S. worldwide. Previously, Dr. Eastman served as the chief of the Reese Jones Trauma Center at Parkland Memorial Hospital and as an assistant professor and trauma surgeon in the Division of Burns Trauma and Critical Care at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Eastman is also a decorated police officer within the Dallas Police Department. Without objection, the witness's full statements will be inserted in the record. I now ask each witness to summarize his statement for five minutes Beginning Thank all the witnesses for their testimony. I will remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the panel. I will now recognize myself for questions. Um, Chief Hastings, early last month, ProPublica released video footage of Carlos Hernandez Vasquez, who was being held in Border Patrol custody in May of 2019. And the video shows in heartbreaking detail the last hours of Carlos's life. He was 16 years old at the time. He died in his cell just hours after a nurse practitioner apparently recommended immediate medical care. In fact, his body was first discovered um, by his cellmate, who was another child who was being held in detention. Understanding that this specific case is still under investigation, what can you tell us about the lessons CBP has learned from this particular case? So, ma'am, I, I would start by saying dignity, dignity and care of those are of the utmost important. I'm a, I'm a father. I'm a grand, I'm a, I have a granddaughter as well. Um, I watched the video. I saw the same video from the media report, and, and the, the video itself was troubling. Um, as you know, the case is still under OIG investigation. I can't speak to what their findings are. One thing I can add is that I know that all of the video has been turned over. All, all the items that we had, the video of all the cells has been turned over to OIG and they have all the video. Not just a piece, as I understand, that was pulled from, from the Sheriff's Department. So are you insinuating that there is more, that, I, I'm not sure what you're insinuating. So. As I said, all of the video that we had throughout the station that day has been turned over to OIG. And what did it show? I, I haven't seen it, ma'am. I just know that we have turned it over and provided to OIG, who's the independent investigator. So I was just curious about what you were insinuating by saying we just saw a little snippet, but that... I'm, I'm just insinuating Morgan. we've turned over all the evidence and all the video. Okay, so broadly speaking, what do you think could have been done differently without talking about what was done? Your review of the case, um, 
What do you think could have been done differently? It's been indicated that welfare checks were conducted on um, this young boy, uh, young teen, but the video shows an increasingly sick Carlos in pain, vomiting up blood, writhing around in pain until he falls unconscious to the floor of his cell. And this happened over a course of hours. Um, so I'm wondering, is there a finding by your, just your internal review that maybe it wasn't understood the level of medical attention that he needed when he was in the cell at that time? So I, again, it's ongoing and, and certainly any lessons learned from any of the investigations, this investigation or any others we'll look at to make changes. I can tell you that we did put out guidance to the field that any of those, and I believe this was July, a memorandum from then Commissioner Saunders went out, um, any subjects in, in our custody were receiving welfare checks every 15 minutes and being documented in our system of record. You mean person, not subject in your custody? Person, yes, ma'am. Because that's what they are. They're people, not people, subjects. Um, can you tell us what policies are in place to ensure that recommendations that you receive from medical professionals are actually followed, and what measures exist to protect healthcare professionals who refuse to clear patients for detention? I mean, I'm assuming that a CBP officer has to stay with any child or human in, deta in detention if they go to a health facility, is that correct? That is correct. And are you aware of pressure that CBP officers are putting on medical professionals to release patients so that they can get back to their job at the border or at whatever facility to which they are assigned? No, ma'am, I'm not. In fact, in reviewing some of the IG uh, investigation material, I saw the contrary where one of our agents actually asked for additional care and, and stood up for um, one of the children that was sick until the fever was down. Um, so we've seen well, the opposite. That's, that's a good story to hear, um, but there have also been indications that health professionals feel intimidated and pressured by CBP personnel to release patients to detention even when it's not medically indicated. Um, and to me, it seems like doctors should be the ones making these decisions, not CBP officers. Um, what, what policies are in place to ensure that recommendations of medical professionals are followed? I mean, are there policies? I mean. So, yeah, we have multiple policies, and we work closely with uh, both CWMD as well as our own Office of Support. Um, we have medical staff at our, that we have hired to oversee the contract and to make sure that we're providing the best care we can in the family practitioner model. Dr. Eastman, it's good to see you again. As the senior medical officer in the Department of Homeland Security, when you make recommendations for the medical care of individuals, in CBP's custody, are they followed by CBP? Nice to see you as well, ma'am. And yes, we work collaboratively with CBP to advise and help implement the recommendations that we offer. In fact, we have our employee, a CWMD employee, is the senior medical advisor at CBP. And this team works collaboratively to implement uh, the recommendations that are made with a hearty respect to the fact that there are operational considerations as well. If you look at some of the um, cases involved with the children that I mentioned, every single one of them um, was, was very, very sick and should have been hospitalized and never released back into CBP custody. So there has to be, um, I would hope, some effort to review where these mistakes were made that these children who were very, very sick, one of whom had a temperature of 105.7 when they were initially um, examined. I mean, I, I just don't understand how that could even be possible. I mean, are CBP officers trained to, I know they're not medical professionals, but it doesn't take, you don't have to be a doctor to see that a child has a 105.7 temperature. So what? Ma'am, we, we do the absolute best we can to provide the best care possible to the children in our custody. But there is not a mechanism for us as the Department of Homeland Security to review the care that's provided outside our system in community hospitals all along the border. And I think- Well, I'm talking about that initial, I mean, it was a nurse practitioner, I believe, who examined Carlos and gave him Tamiflu because that's what he was diagnosed with. But have you recommended flu vaccines for detained migrants? 
Ma'am, our approach to the flu vaccine is a comprehensive one that encompasses uh, all of the settings where care is delivered along the southwest border. In fact, so is everyone the, given, the, is the, every detained migrant the, given a flu shot? The Department of Homeland Security's vaccination strategy has resulted in more than 60,000 vaccinations being given, predominantly in the ICE Health Service Corps. Our goal is to give her to give the right vaccine to the right person at the right time. Have you spoken with the acting secretary about ways to ensure that CBP follows your medical recommendations? Ma'am, like I said, the, the direction from leadership from the secretary to all the acting secretaries I've worked has been the same, to do the right thing for the right for the people in our custody and for all of us to work together to do just that. I understand. I'm just asking you, and you can just say yes or no, have you specifically spoken with the acting secretary about ways to ensure that CBP follows your metal, medical recommendations? Yes, ma'am. Prior to his current role as the acting secretary, we spoke along the border. And you, do you continue those conversations? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Chief uh, Hastings. Apropos of what um, my friend Mr. Higgins was asking you, uh, would you agree that taking $3.5 billion from a military counter drug program would be problematic? Um, because there is reporting today indicating that the president is planning to divert $7.2 billion in Pentagon funding to build his wall. Would you find that to be problematic in terms of addressing the issues that you testified about? So, ma'am, I would also add, though, on the other hand, we, we had this, we had a very large influx of families and children. We also had an influx of single adults. We saw those numbers go up. And I would also add that we had 147,000 gotaways that we know of last year. So we, we have not only asylum seekers turning themselves in, but people trying to elude as well. Uh, and we need, this is a whole of government approach to many things that we need to protect and safeguard our borders. And do you think taking $3.5 billion from a military counter drug program is a prob would be a problem to address the issues that you're talking Yes or no? We need border wall. I can tell you that. I didn't ask you that. Can you ask, answer the question I asked you? Can you ask the question again? Sure. Do you think it's problematic that the president wants to take $3.5 billion from a military counter drug program? I think we, again, I would say- Is there a reason no. why you can't just say yes or no? No, I don't. So you don't think that's, prob that's not problematic? I, I, for our needs, there are needs that we have on the border as well to secure our border. And, and wall and construction is one of those. Okay. I now recognize Chairman Thompson for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Let me just say that I, 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 I think I can speak for my good friend, Mr. Higgins, the ranking member. But I want to thank Mr. Hastings and Dr. Eastman for coming today. There are people in positions above you who don't show up, who don't answer the call, which is their duty. And so the fact that you two showed up and took some difficult questions, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful because you could have done what they did. Um, we are well within our constitutional obligation of having a role in oversight. Um, I want to thank the ranking member on this subcommittee because we have been trying to address this issue before anyone is a Republican, a Democrat, black, white, male, woman. We are all human beings and we're all Americans. And I know that I think I can speak for everyone in this room and certainly on this committee that even one death in custody is a tragedy. And uh, Dr. Eastman, I remember meeting you before you even got the position because it was one of the issues we've tried to address is how quickly we can bring qualified people like you in to help solve this problem. And um, I wanna thank you. I know that you've had um, contact with uh, my colleague, Ms. Underwood, who has a medical background. And it's relationships like this that are gonna help us all address um, the, these tragedies and, and ensure that they don't happen again. These are children who are being brought here for a better life, which is all any of us want for our children. Thank you. I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we ask that you, some of which we spoke about um, during the questioning. We ask that you respond as expeditiously as possible in writing to those questions. Without objection, the subcommittee record shall be kept open for 10 days. Hearing no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned.